Chapter Two of Little Fuzzy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Little Fuzzy by H. Beam Piper. Chapter Two. Jack Holloway landed the manipulator in front of the cluster of prefab huts. For a moment he sat still, realizing that he was tired, and then he climbed down from the control cabin and crossed the open grass to the door of the main living hut, opening it and reaching in to turn on the lights. Then he hesitated, looking up at Darius. There was a wide ring around it, and he remembered noticing the wisps of cirrus clouds gathering overhead through the afternoon. Maybe it would rain tonight. This dry weather couldn't last forever. He had been letting the manipulator stand out overnight lately. He decided to put it in the hangar. He went and opened the door of the vehicle shed, got back into the machine, and floated it inside. When he came back to the living hut, he saw that he'd left the door wide open. "'Damn fool!' he rebuked himself. "'Place could be crawling with prawns by now.' He looked quickly around the living-room, under the big combination desk and library table, under the gun-rack, under the chairs, back of the communication screen and the view-screen, beyond the metal cabinet of the microfilm library, and saw nothing. Then he hung up his hat, took off his pistol, and laid it on the table, and went back to the bathroom to wash his hands. As soon as he put on the light, something inside the shower-stall said, Yeek! in a startled voice. He turned quickly to see two wide eyes staring up at him out of a ball of golden fur. Whatever it was, it had a round head and big ears, and a vaguely humanoid face with a little snub nose. It was sitting on its haunches, and in that position it was about a foot high. It had two tiny hands with opposing thumbs. He squatted to have a better look at it. "'Hello there, little feller,' he greeted it. "'I never saw anything like you before. What are you, anyhow?' The small creature looked at him seriously and said, "'Eek!' in a timid voice. "'Why, sure, you're a little fuzzy, that's what you are.' He moved closer, careful to make no alarmingly sudden movements, and kept on talking to it. "'Bet you slipped in while I left the door open. Well, if a little fuzzy finds the door open, I'd like to know why he shouldn't come in and have a look around.' He touched it gently. It started to draw back, then reached out a little hand and felt the material of his shirt-sleeve. He stroked it, and told it that it had the softest, silkiest fur ever. Then he took it on his lap. It yeeked in pleasure, and stretched an arm up around his neck. "'Why, sure, we're going to be good friends, aren't we? Would you like something to eat? Well, suppose you and I go see what we can find.' He put one hand under it, to support it like a baby. At least he seemed to recall having seen babies supported in that way. Babies were things he didn't fool with if he could help it, and straightened. It weighed between fifteen and twenty pounds. At first it struggled in panic, then quieted and seemed to enjoy being carried. In the living room he sat down in his favourite armchair, under a standing lamp, and examined his new acquaintance. It was a mammal. There was a fairly large mammalian class on Zarathustra, but beyond that he was stumped. It wasn't a primate in the Terran sense. It wasn't like anything Terran, or anything else on Zarathustra. Being a biped put it in a class by itself for this planet. It was just a little fuzzy, and that was the best he could do. That sort of nomenclature was the best anybody could do on a Class Three planet. On a Class Four planet, say Loki or Cheshire or Thor, naming animals was a cinch. You pointed to something and asked a native, and he'd gargle a mouthful of syllables at you, which might only mean, what do you want to know for? And you took it down in phonetic alphabet, and the what's it had a name. But on Zarathustra there were no natives to ask, so this was a little fuzzy. "'What would you like to eat, little fuzzy?' he asked. "'Open your mouth and let Pappy Jack see what you have to chew with.' Little fuzzy's dental equipment, allowing for the fact that his jaw was rounder, was very much like his own. "'You're probably omnivorous. How would you like some nice Terran Federation Space Forces emergency ration extraterrestrial Type Three? he asked. Little Fuzzy made what sounded like an expression of willingness to try it. It would be safe enough. XD-3 had been fed to a number of Zarathustran mammals without ill effects. He carried Little Fuzzy out into the kitchen and put him on the floor, then got out a tin of the field ration and opened it, breaking off a small piece and handing it down. Little Fuzzy took the piece of golden-brown cake, sniffed at it, gave a delighted yeek, and crammed the whole piece in his mouth. 
You never had to live on that stuff and nothing else for a month, that's for sure. He broke the cake in half and broke one half into manageable pieces and put it down on a saucer. Maybe Little Fuzzy would want a drink, too. He started to fill a pan with water, as he would for a dog, then looked at his visitor, sitting on his haunches, eating with both hands, and changed his mind. He rinsed a plastic cup cap from an empty whisky bottle and put it down beside a deep bowl of water. Little Fuzzy was thirsty, and he didn't have to be shown what the cup was for. It was too late to get himself anything elaborate. He found some leftovers in the refrigerator and combined them into a stew. While it was heating, he sat down at the kitchen table and lit his pipe. The spurt of flame from the lighter opened Little Fuzzy's eyes, but what really awed him was Pappy Jack blowing smoke. He sat watching this phenomenon, until a few minutes later the stew was hot and the pipe was laid aside. Then Little Fuzzy went back to nibbling XT3. Suddenly he gave a yeek of petulance and scampered into the living room. In a moment he was back with something elongated and metallic which he laid on the floor beside him. "'What have you got there, Little Fuzzy? Let Pappy Jack see.' Then he recognised it as his own one-inch wood chisel. He remembered leaving it in the outside shed after doing some work about a week ago, and not being able to find it when he'd gone to look for it. That had worried him. People who got absent-minded about equipment didn't last long in the wilderness. After he finished eating and took the dishes to the sink, he went over and squatted beside his new friend. "'Let Pappy Jack look at it, little Fuzzy,' he said. "'Oh, I'm not going to take it away from you. I just want to see it.' The edge was dulled and nicked. It had been used for a lot of things wood chisels oughtn't to be used for. Digging and prying, and most likely it had been used as a weapon. It was a handy-sized, all-purpose tool for a little Fuzzy. He laid it on the floor where he had gotten it, and started washing the dishes. Little Fuzzy watched him with interest for a while, and then he began investigating the kitchen. Some of the things he wanted to investigate had to be taken away from him. At first that angered him, but he soon learned that there were things he wasn't supposed to have. Eventually the dishes got washed. There were more things to investigate in the living room. One of them was the wastebasket. He found that it could be dumped, and promptly dumped it, pulling out everything that hadn't fallen out. He bit a corner off a sheet of paper, chewed on it, and spat it out in disgust. Then he found that crumpled paper could be flattened out, and so he flattened a few sheets, and then discovered that it could also be folded. Then he got himself gleefully tangled in a snarl of worn-out recording tape. Finally he lost interest and started away. Jack caught him and brought him back. "'No, little Fuzzy,' he said. "'You do not dump wastebaskets and then walk away from them. You put things back in.' He touched the container and said slowly and distinctly, "Wastebasket." Then he righted it, doing it as Little Fuzzy would have to, and picked up a piece of paper, tossing it from Little Fuzzy's shoulder height. Then he handed Little Fuzzy a wad of paper and repeated, Wastebasket. Little Fuzzy looked at him and said something that sounded as though it might be, "'What's the matter with you, Pappy? You crazy or something?' After a couple more tries, however, he got it, and began throwing things in. In a few minutes he had everything back in, except a brightly coloured plastic cartridge box and a wide-mouthed bottle with a screw cap. He held these up and said, "'Eek!' "'Yes, you can have them. Here, let Pappy Jack show you something.' He showed Little Fuzzy how the box could be opened and shut. Then, holding it where Little Fuzzy could watch, he unscrewed the cap, and then screwed it on again. "'There, now. You try it.' Little Fuzzy looked up inquiringly, then took the bottle, sitting down and holding it between his knees. Unfortunately, he tried twisting it the wrong way, and only screwed the cap on tighter. He yeeked plaintively. "'No, go ahead. You can do it.' Little Fuzzy looked at the bottle again. Then he tried twisting the cap the other way, and it loosened. He gave a yeek that couldn't possibly be anything but Eureka, and promptly took it off, holding it up. After being commended, he examined both the bottle and the cap, feeling the threads, and then screwed the cap back on again. "'You know, you're a smart little Fuzzy.' It took a few seconds to realise just how smart. Little Fuzzy had wondered why you twisted the cap one way to take it off and the other way to put it on, and he had found out. For pure reasoning ability, that topped anything in the way of animal intelligence he'd ever seen. "'I'm going to tell Ben Rainsford about you.' 
Going to the communication screen, he punched out the wavelength combination of the naturalist's camp, seventy miles down Snake River from the mouth of Cold Creek. Rainsford's screen must have been on automatic. It lit as soon as he was through punching. There was a card set up in front of it, lettered, Away on trip, back the 15th, recorder on. Ben, Jack Holloway, he said. I just ran into something interesting. He explained briefly what it was. I hope he stays around until you get back. He's totally unlike anything I've ever seen on this planet. Little Fuzzy was disappointed when Jack turned off the screen. That had been interesting. He picked him up and carried him over to the armchair, taking him on his lap. Now, he said, reaching for the control panel of the view screen, watch this. We're going to see something nice. When he put on the screen at random, he got a view from close up of the great fires that were raging where the company people were burning off the dead forests on what used to be Big Blackwater Swamp. Little Fuzzy cried out in alarm, flung his arms around Pappy Jack's neck, and buried his face in the bosom of his shirt. Well, forest fires started from lightning sometimes, and they'd be bad things for Little Fuzzy. He worked the selector and got another pickup this time on the top of Company House in Mallorysport, three time zones west, with the city spread out below and the sunset blazing in the west. Little Fuzzy stared at it in wonder. It was pretty impressive for a little fellow who'd spent all his life in the big woods. So was the spaceport and a lot of other things he saw, though a view of the planet as a whole from Darius puzzled him considerably. Then, in the middle of a symphony orchestra concert from Mallorysport Opera House, he wriggled loose, dropped to the floor, and caught up his wood-chisel, swinging it back over his shoulder like a two-handed sword. "'What the devil? Uh-oh!' A land-prawn, which must have gotten in while the door was open, was crossing the living-room. Little Fuzzy ran after and passed it, pivoted and brought the corner of the chisel-edge down on the prawn's neck, neatly beheading it. He looked at his victim for a moment, then slid the chisel under it and flipped it over on its back, slapping it twice with the flat and cracking the undershell. Then he began pulling the dead prawn apart, tearing out pieces of meat and eating them delicately. After disposing of the larger chunks, he used the chisel to chop off one of the prawn's mandibles to use as a pick to get at the less accessible morsels. When he had finished, he licked his fingers clean and started back to the armchair. No. Jack pointed at the prawn shell. Waste basket. Yeek! Waste basket. Little Fuzzy gathered up the bits of shell, putting them where they belonged. Then he came back and climbed up on Pappy Jack's lap and looked at things in the screen until he fell asleep. Jack lifted him carefully and put him down on the warm chair seat without wakening him, then went to the kitchen, poured himself a drink, and brought it to the big table, where he lit his pipe and began writing up his diary for the day. After a while Little Fuzzy woke, found that the lap he had gone to sleep on had vanished, and yeeked disconsolately. A folded blanket in one corner of the bedroom made a satisfactory bed, once Little Fuzzy had assured himself that there were no bugs in it. He brought in his bottle and his plastic box, and put them on the floor beside it. Then he ran to the front door in the living-room and yeeked to be let out. Going about twenty feet from the house, he used the chisel to dig a small hole— and after it had served its purpose, he filled it in carefully and came running back. Well, maybe fuzzies were naturally gregarious and were homemakers, den holes or nests or something like that. Nobody wants messes made in the house, and when the young ones did it, their parents would bang them around to teach them better manners. This was little fuzzy's home now. He knew how he ought to behave in it. The next morning at daylight he was up on the bed trying to dig Pappy Jack out from under the blankets. Besides being a most efficient land prawn and eradicator, he made a first-rate alarm clock. But best of all, he was Pappy Jack's little fuzzy. He wanted out. This time Jack took his movie camera and got the whole operation on film. One thing, there'd have to be a little door with a spring to hold it shut that little fuzzy could operate himself. That was designed during breakfast. It only took a couple of hours to make and install it. Little Fuzzy got the idea as soon as he saw it, and figured out how to work it for himself. Jack went back to the workshop, built a fire in the hand forge, and forged a pointed and rather broad blade, four inches long, on the end of a foot of quarter-inch round tool steel. It was too point-heavy when finished, so he welded a knob on the other end to balance it. Little Fuzzy knew what that was for right away. 
Running outside, he dug a couple of practice holes with it, and then began casting about in the grass for land prawns. Jack followed him with the camera, and got movies of a couple of prawn killings, accomplished with smooth-by-the-numbers precision. Little Fuzzy hadn't learned that chop-clap-clap routine in the week since he had found the wood-chisel. Going into the shed, he hunted for something without more than a general idea of what it would look like, and found it where Little Fuzzy had discarded it when he found the chisel. It was a stock of hardwood, a foot long, rubbed down and polished smooth, apparently with sandstone. There was a paddle at one end, with enough of an edge to behead a prawn, and the other end had been worked to a point. He took it into the living hut, and sat down at the desk to examine it with a magnifying glass. Bits of soil embedded in the sharp end, that had been used as a pick. The paddle end had been used as a shovel, beheader, and shell cracker. Little Fuzzy had known exactly what he wanted when he'd started making that thing. He'd kept on until it was as perfect as possible, and had stopped short of spoiling it by over-refinement. Finally, Jack put it away in the top drawer of the desk. He was thinking about what to get for lunch when Little Fuzzy burst into the living room, clutching his new weapon and yeeking excitedly. "'What's the matter, kid? You got troubles?' He rose and went to the gun-rack, picking down a rifle and checking the chamber. "'Show Babby Jack what it is.' Little Fuzzy followed him to the big door for human-type people, ready to bolt back inside if necessary. The trouble was a harpy, a thing about the size and general design of a Terran Jurassic pterodactyl, big enough to take a little fuzzy at one mouthful. It must have made one swoop at him already, and was circling back for another. It ran into a six-millimetre rifle bullet, went into a backward loop, and dropped like a stone. Little Fuzzy made a very surprised remark, looking at the dead harpy for a moment, and then spotted the ejected empty cartridge. He grabbed it and held it up, asking if he could have it. When told that he could, he ran back to the bedroom with it. When he returned, Pappy Jack picked him up and carried him to the hangar and up into the control cabin of the manipulator. The throbbing of the contragravity field generator and the sense of rising worried him at first. But after they had picked up the harpy with the grapples and risen to five hundred feet, he began to enjoy the ride. They dropped the harpy a couple of miles up what the latest maps were designating as Holloway's Run, and then made a wide circle back over the mountains. Little Fuzzy thought it was fun. After lunch, Little Fuzzy had a nap on Pappy Jack's bed. Jack took the manipulator up to the diggings, put off a couple more shots, uncovered more flint, and found another sunstone. It wasn't often that he found sunstones on two successive days. When he returned to the camp, Little Fuzzy was picking another land prawn apart in front of the living hut. After dinner, Little Fuzzy liked cooked food too if it wasn't too hot, they went into the living room. He remembered having seen a bolt and nut in the desk drawer when he had been putting the wooden prawn killer away, and he got it out, showing it to Little Fuzzy. Little Fuzzy studied it for a moment, then ran into the bedroom and came back with his screw top bottle. He took the top off, put it on again, and then screwed the nut off the bolt, holding it up. "'See, Pappy?' or yeeks to that effect. "'Nothing to it.' Then he unscrewed the bottle top, dropped the bolt inside after replacing the nut, and screwed the cap on again. "'Eek!' he said, with considerable self-satisfaction. He had a right to be satisfied with himself. What he'd been doing had been generalising. Bottle-tops and nuts belonged to the general class of things that screwed on to things. To take them off, you turned left. To put them on again, you turned right, after making sure that the threads engaged. And since he could conceive of right and left-handedness, that might mean that he could think of properties apart from objects, and that was forming abstract ideas. Maybe that was going a little far, but— You know, Pappy Jack's got himself a mighty smart little fuzzy— "'Are you a grown-up little fuzzy, or are you just a baby little fuzzy? "'Shucks, I'll bet you're Professor Dr. Fuzzy.' "'He wondered what to give the Professor, if that was what he was, to work on next, "'and he doubted the wisdom of teaching him too much about taking things apart just at present. "'Sometime he might come home and find something important taken apart, "'or worse, taken apart and put together incorrectly. "'Finally he went to a closet, rummaging in it until he found a tin canister.' By the time he returned, Little Fuzzy had gotten up on the chair, found his pipe in the ashtray, and was puffing on it and coughing. "'Hey, I don't think that's good for you.' He recovered the pipe, wiped the stem on his shirt-sleeve, and put it in his mouth. 
then placed the canister on the floor, and put Little Fuzzy on the floor beside it. There were about ten pounds of stones in it. When he had first settled here, he had made a collection of the local minerals, and after learning what he had wanted to, he had thrown them out, all but twenty or thirty of the prettiest specimens. He was glad now that he had kept these. Little Fuzzy looked the can over, decided that the lid was a member of the class of things that screwed on to things, and got it off. The inside of the lid was mirror-shiny, and it took him a little thought to discover that what he saw in it was only himself. He yeeked about that, and looked into the can. This, he decided, belonged to the class of things that can be dumped, like waste-baskets, so he dumped it on the floor. Then he began examining the stones and sorting them by colour. Except for an interest in colourful views on the screen, this was the first real evidence that Fuzzies possessed colour perception. He proceeded to give further and more impressive proof, laying out the stones by shade in correct spectral order, from a lump of amethyst-like quartz to a dark red stone. Well, maybe he'd seen rainbows. Maybe he'd lived near a big misty waterfall where there was always a rainbow when the sun was shining. Or maybe that was just his natural way of seeing colours. Then, when he saw what he had to work with, he began making arrangements with them, laying them out in odd circular and spiral patterns. Each time he finished a pattern, he would yeek happily to call attention to it, sit and look at it for a while, and then take it apart and start a new one. Little Fuzzy was capable of artistic gratification, too. He made useless things, just for the pleasure of making and looking at them. Finally, he put the stones back into the tin, put the lid on, and rolled it into the bedroom, writing it beside his bed along with his other treasures. The new weapon he laid on the blanket beside him when he went to bed. The next morning Jack broke up a whole cake of XT3, and put it down, filled the bowl with water, and after making sure he'd left nothing lying about that a little fuzzy could damage, or on which he might hurt himself, took the manipulator up to the diggings. He worked all morning, cracking nearly a ton and a half of flint, and found nothing. Then he set off a string of shots, brought down an avalanche of sandstone and exposed more flint, and sat down under a pool-ball tree to eat his lunch. Half an hour after he went back to work, he found the fossil of some jellyfish that hadn't eaten the right things in the right combinations. But a little later he found four nodules, one after another, and two of them were sunstones. Four or five chunks later he found a third— why, this must be the dying place of the jellyfish. By late afternoon, when he had cleaned up all his loose flint, he had nine, including one deep red monster an inch in diameter. There must have been some connection current in the ancient ocean that had swirled them all into this one place. He considered setting off some more shots, decided that it was too late, and returned to camp. "'Little Fuzzy,' he called, opening the living-room door. "'Where are you, Little Fuzzy? Pappy Jack's rich. We're going to celebrate.' Silence. He called again. Still no reply or scamper of feet. Probably cleaned up all the prawns around the camp, and went hunting further out into the woods, thought Jack. Unbuckling his gun and dropping it onto the table, he went out into the kitchen. Most of the XT-3 was gone. In the bedroom he found that Little Fuzzy had dumped the stones out of the biscuit tin, and made an arrangement, and laid the wood chisel in a neat diagonal across the blanket. After getting dinner assembled and in the oven, he went out and called for a while, then mixed a highball and took it into the living-room, sitting down with it to go over his day's findings. Rather incredulously, he realised that he had cracked out at least seventy-five thousand sols' worth of stones to-day. He put them into the bag and sat sipping the highball, and thinking pleasant thoughts until the bell on the stove warned him that dinner was ready. He ate alone. After all the years he had been doing that contentedly, it had suddenly become intolerable, and in the evening he dialed through his microfilm library, finding only books he had read and re-read a dozen times, or books he kept for reference. Several times he thought he heard the little door open, but each time he was mistaken. Finally he went to bed. As soon as he woke he looked across at the folded blanket, but the wood-chisel was still lying athwart it. He put down more XD-3, and changed the water in the bowl before leaving for the diggings. That day he found three more sunstones, and put them in the bag mechanically and without pleasure. He quit work early, and spent over an hour spiralling around the camp, but saw nothing. The XD-3 in the kitchen was untouched. Maybe the little fellow ran into something too big for him, even with his fine new weapon—a hob-thrush, or a bush-goblin, or another harpy. 
or maybe he'd just gotten tired of staying in one place and had moved on. No, he'd liked it here. He'd had fun and been happy. He shook his head sadly. Once he, too, had lived in a pleasant place where he'd had fun and could have been happy if he hadn't thought there was something he'd had to do. So he'd gone away, leaving grieved people behind him. Maybe that was how it was with Little Fuzzy. Maybe he didn't realise how much of a place he'd made for himself here, or how empty he was leaving it. He started for the kitchen to get a drink and checked himself. Take a drink because you pity yourself, and then the drink pities you and has a drink, and then two good drinks get together and that calls for drinks all around. No, he'd have one drink, maybe a little bigger than usual, before he went to bed. End of chapter 2